Okay, first of all, I want to let you know that when you talk about last time, we talk about you said that uh, some some family members do prefer not to marry the same family name, and yeah. I told you that's probably not true. It's true. Some people do. It's <laughs> so you were correct. Well, they, I was. Well, I was go. correct. Yeah, I was corrected by many of my audiences. Now it's not mm -hmm. uh, everywhere in China. You know, China is still very uh, different regions and different oh, absolutely. locals. They have their tradition and some of them mm -hmm. really long traditions and the tradition ranging from how to get married, how to, you know, doing the funerals, all kinds of things mm -hmm. are very different. South, North, East, mm -hmm. West China, they're very, very different. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, it's not as uh, um, prevalent as they used to in Southern China, but there are still places People yeah. prefer not to marry yeah. the same family number. So you're correct. Absolutely. Well, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Very healthy, if I may say. <laughs> just, 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 just yeah. saying. Yeah. Uh, uh, no doubt explains uh, uh, what you sometimes hear that, you know, Chinese people are healthy and strong <laughs> um, as compared to people yeah. in some other places, which I'm not going to name. Anyway, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's start it in Asia, the the yeah. Korean Peninsula. The situation there is getting, I don't think it, it's got a lot of coverage in the West, but yeah. uh, in China, lots of people are talking about that because the um, I think both South and North Korea, they have been dropping flyers to each other through balloons, right? They yeah. propaganda things. But then the, what escalated is that uh, at some point, the North Korean got tired of all these balloon things. So instead of they also drop flyers, they drop some trash into South Korea. And South yeah. Korea this time responded not with balloons, but with drones. And now the drones was very close to uh, the capital. And now they're, what they did is to throw the, again, uh, flyers, but but it's drones. So it's getting serious mm -hmm. because Kim Jong-un certainly doesn't like that, right? The, the drones mm -hmm. came in because they can do other things with drones. So with that, Kim Jong-il sent troops to the border. And not only mm -hmm. that, he also dismantled the, both the, the bus, I mean, the, the road, the train, rat, train track, etc. So the things get, get tense. Now, the Chinese netizens take on that is that they think the United States is behind it. And the purpose of that is, of, of course, increase the tensity uh, for the peninsula, pen, pen, uh, Korea Peninsula and to scare away investors to China. What is your take on that? I'm not sure about the last because, again, uh -huh. it's very difficult sometimes to read the United States. I think that obviously they do want to scare investors away from China. But I mean, I think they have simpler ways to do it. Sanctions and that kind of thing. I, I think the problem is that we're in the last weeks, months now of an extremely dangerous administration that has been looking for conflict wherever it can. It's failed in everything it's tried. It's tried up to now. But its instinct in these last months, whilst it's still there, is to escalate. And I think they are behind it. I think this, I mean, I, I think it is inconceivable that the South Koreans would make such an such a provocative move. Sending drones close to or across the border is an extremely provocative mood, move. As you correctly say, mm -hmm. they can carry weapons. We see mm -hmm. that every day in the fighting in Ukraine. So uh, the North Koreans are inevitably going to respond. The South Koreans would never do a thing like this by themselves. But I think that what the um, Americans are trying to do, what this current administration is trying to do, it is directed at China, but not at investors. It is mm -hmm. trying to get North Korea to respond which it will, it's trying then to flag up the issue of tension on the Korean peninsula. It's going to try and use that specifically in Japan, which is this country which is going through a period of transition and where there's now talk about you know, the um, Pacific NATO. And they're going to say, look, the North Koreans are making dangerous moves, They've got nuclear weapons. China is behind them. Russia now is also behind them because the Russians are in the process of ratifying this treaty with North Korea, which is very similar, by the way, to the one that China already has. And so what you do, what you need, you need us. You need us to be there. You must agree that we increase our military facilities even more 
in Japan and in the islands in, in, in North Korea and in South Korea as well. They'll be saying exactly the same thing to the South Koreans too, you know, all this danger from the North, which you have yourself provoked. Who can you turn to for protection? Only us. And that will then move this process of creating the Pacific NATO a little bit further. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it will also create problems between China and South Korea. South Korea um, is, you know, its major trading partner, by the way, mm -hmm. is China. Um, I, I, I think that is the objective behind all of these moves. It is the perennial provocative belligerence of this administration and we see it playing out now yeah and it just uh, seems like a uh, whatever they do they can't see stability <laughs> anywhere in the, in the world <laughs> they would do everything they can to create fear you know stuff like yeah and I guess that's probably part of the reason China responded with this drill, right? The East Command, uh, Theater Commander drill, mm -hmm. which also another big topic in China. Um, the there, there are two things that people believe that the message. Uh, one is, of course, the October tenth is the Republic of China. Uh, yeah, Republic of China, which is Taiwan's official name. Okay, Republic mm -hmm. of China's uh, National Day, October tenth. And during that celebration, the leader there said some pretty provocative things that yeah. both, you know, China and the Taiwan, they are not affiliated and stuff like that. Very much independent speech. Um, so China, I think the drill is 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 a message for him. But then the 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 second thing is notice that the when they announced this drill, it's actually on the website they have both Chinese and English. So. Lots yeah. of people interpret that as it's what it's also a message to the West that we actually can take Taiwan when, whenever we want to. Uh, don't provoke us. Don't make it the worse. Is that how you interpret it? Yes, I think it is. And the fact that it's both in English and in Chinese makes it absolutely clear that it is a warning addressed specifically and principally to the United States. But can I just go back a little and, and mm -hmm. touch on your first pop point about the fact that this is an incredibly dangerous administration which cannot see peace and stability anywhere and stop trying to disrupt it. Now, we have had a very interesting article, very important article in some respects by the British historian Adam Toos, who is a friend of the United States and very much a friend of the Democrats. And he's written a most interesting article in The Guardian, which has looked at this policy of the administration, which he has up to now defended and say, well, just a moment, maybe when we look at what it's doing, when we look at what it's been doing principally against China, but in every other place too, maybe it's not so benign. Maybe it is in fact ultimately a neocon administration behaving in an aggressive way around the world. Now, he's not someone who is going to come to that view easily. As I said, his instincts are to be as pro-American as it can possibly be. But it's becoming impossible to ignore the truth of this, that this is an administration which is consistently looking to escalate points of crisis wherever it can, including, obviously, the Korean Peninsula, which we have just discussed, and including in the South China Sea and in Taiwan. Now, Taiwan is an extreme case because the Chinese have been giving warning after warning after mm -hmm. warning about Taiwan for years now. You know, it's extraordinary to say this, but five, six years ago, nobody talked about Taiwan. The situation there was completely stable. <laughs> it, it was, you know, it was a peaceful place. China was peaceful. The Chinese had no intention at that time of invading Taiwan. They weren't seeking to create a massive fleet. They weren't looking to do anything. And then we've had the United States has been backing these secessionist movements in Taiwan itself. The new president of Taiwan, I'm not going to repeat what he said, but he made, I mean, what he said was unbelievably provocative. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't just secessionist. It was 
in effect, questioning the entire legitimacy of the People's Republic. I mean, it was off the scale provocative. And there's no way he would have said a thing like that unless he'd first cleared it with whatever US representatives there are in Taiwan and without the Americans in advance agreeing to it. So he, he said all of that. Ty, the Americans have been arming Taiwan and they've been doing this for years, despite, as you pointed out to me in a previous programme, the fact that at the time when diplomatic relations between China and the United States uh, were established, the United States gave a solemn undertaking that it would sl scale down and eventually end arms deliveries to Taiwan. They've taken every move, every step to try to escalate the situation. And the Chinese have not only warned against it, but they've come in close to saying enough. So yeah. um, China's fleet is getting more powerful, as inevitably it would, especially in the face of this sort of provocation. It's conducting these major exercises around Taiwan. I think it is both. It is several things. Firstly, it is a show of resolve. It is a show of resolve to the Chinese people, which, by the way, includes the people of Taiwan. It is a warning to the United States. And I have to say this, it also looks to me like a rehearsal of what China might do if it's pushed far enough, if this particular so-called president in Taiwan does go the full way and start making serious moves towards announcing Taiwan, Taiwanese secession. So I, I, I think this is what it is. I think it serves multiple purposes. And as you absolutely correctly said, as the Chinese netizens, I'm sure, are also saying, the fact that this, um, this description of this exercise is also, uh, you know, this official statement about this exercise is also published in English. It, it is clearly an attempt to try to alert people in Washington perhaps the income, the people of whatever incoming administration we get, perhaps the wiser and more level-headed people in the Pentagon, that, you know, you are playing with fire here. Mm -hmm. You are pushing us to where we don't want to go, but where we will go if we have to. One of the things, the spokesperson, the, this is the, the uh, Minister of Defence, uh, have a spokesperson came out to talk about it. He actually said that. He said, uh, every time when you push further, we our exercise will be one step further. So that means if you get to a point that, that is totally unsustainable to us, then we will just go it all the way. I, that's how I interpreted it. Well, so, yes. <laughs> so, that, so that's um, pretty clear. I, 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 don't, I don't think these exercises are just for show. No. I mean, I think that's an important thing to say. I think anybody who thinks they are is a fool. And mm -hmm. as, as I've said many, many times, um, you know, there are two rules in international affairs. You don't march on Moscow. And you don't bluff Beijing. If you bluff Beijing, your bluff is going to be called. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. said it many times. Yeah, but they don't. They don't take it. No. I mean, no. yeah. Um, the other thing is the ASEAN summit we talked about last time, and not surprising, they couldn't get a, a joint statement <laughs> this time. Right. They didn't get one last time and last year, and they didn't get one this time. Now. Uh, what is interesting is if you look at the English reporting about that, it says that U.S. Uh, says it's the Russian and China couldn't uh, agree to the joint statement, which mentioned the South China Sea. That language China didn't like and the uh, Russian didn't like that either. But if you look at the Chinese side, the, the Chinese side is saying um, there is argument about the wording about Ukraine, you know, Ukraine situation and the Gaza okay, situation. That's the U.S. doesn't like. And I think probably some of the language Russian doesn't like either. So it seems like none of them like that statement. That's why it didn't. No. What's your take on that? <laughs> I, think that's entirely, I think that is entirely correct. But again, I think the underlying problem is 
well, obviously the Russians have their concerns, but ultimately the people who are always pushing, who are always trying to get declarations and statements that will echo their own positions and which will follow their lines of thinking are the Americans. The Americans, again, pro almost certainly pushed for a very, very hard line statement indeed, as they've done in the G20 meetings and as they've done in all sorts of other places. And I think lots of countries ultimately, probably more than we actually know, said yeah. no. And a few of them that perhaps told the Americans yes, quietly wanted to say no and were very <laughs> relieved when the statement didn't happen. I mean, you know, that there a lot of that's going on. I mean, I know that for a fact because... Um, all sorts of people from various uh, countries around the world, global South countries, uh, and I'm talking about diplomatic people, you know, they've, they've basically in the past contacted me and told me as much. And isn't that interesting? It's ASEAN, you know, Southeast Asian countries, but in the end, it's still the big players <laughs> pull the strings yeah. in behind. <laughs> I find that's, that, I mean, from their perspective, you said that in the past, that they don't want to take side, right? They want yeah. to be left alone, doing trade, getting a, getting along with everybody. But it seems like impossible that you have to take pick a side. It seems like, is that how, how it is nowadays? You have to well, pick a side. Well, well, the United States insists that you mm -hmm, pick a mm -hmm. side uh, yeah, because yeah. they've reduced the entire world to that issue. Either you're with us yeah. or you're against us. Other countries don't say that. China doesn't say. Russia, by the way, doesn't say. Uh -huh. Russia doesn't go around telling everybody you must support us over Ukraine or you're our enemy. I've never heard any Russian official talk that way. Um, but the United States does. If you are going to be treated by the United States as a friend, if you if the Americans are going to consider you a democracy, then you must wholeheartedly and completely agree with the United States. And it's causing tensions right across the whole international system. Well, but why is that? Is that really the, the, the why does U.S. want people to be so clearly be? at least make statement to be on the U.S. side is, I mean, what does U.S. gain from that, forcing people to be on its side? What, what's good for U.S. about that? Right. What it's trying to do in the Pacific, in ASEAN, with ASEAN, mm -hmm. is that it's wanting to keep ASEAN um, in conflict or in some kind of tension with China. Um, that That is really all it's about. Um, the, the United States worries that if it doesn't pressure the ASEAN states all the time, constantly, in every conceivable way that it can, then the ASEAN countries will simply get on with their trade and business with China. And the United States doesn't want that. It is as simple as that. It's not that it worries that these countries left to themselves will become allies of China. No. China doesn't seek alliances with these countries. It is simply that it doesn't want them minding their own business and taking care of themselves. Because if that happens, then they need the United States less and the US itself has less of a role in the region. So in the end, it's still still about control, right? It's still about... Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, why does it's that... Also, US... it's all, it is so... also about China. I think this is something I really want to come back to. Uh, I think a lot of people in China perhaps don't still fully understand this. If you go to the United States, if you read the passage, the, the things that the Americans are saying to themselves, that they're writing, the speeches that they're making, it always, in the end, revolves around China. Ukraine revolves around China. Russia is all about China. We now know that one of the reasons there was a crisis over Ukraine is because when Biden met Putin in Geneva in June 2021, Biden told Putin, I want you to distance Russia from China. And Putin said, no, you know, I want good relations with you, but I'm not going to do that. You know, I have good relations with China. These work well for my country. I'm not going to sacrifice them. And that's why we ended up getting the war in Ukraine. Everything ultimately in Washington is about China. They are obsessed with China uh, um, to a degree that is irrational, but also very dangerous. But 
don't they don't they read maps? I mean, all these are neighbors. You can't just. Uh, I mean, U.S. is far away from China, right? I mean, <clears throat> and then and then the so-called allies, you know, Britain, Australia, they all far away from China, but the China's neighbors, you know, ASEAN countries and mm -hmm. Russia and whoever. <clears throat> They all neighboring China. I mean, they. Why do you want people to work against their own interests to have a bad relationship with your neighbor? It doesn't make any sense. But they never think that way, right? No, they, they don't think that way because they think of the whole world as a complicated chessboard in which they have to have all the pieces. They talk about <laughs> nonsense, and I really do mean that. I I really do judge it to be complete nonsense, like the first island chain. Okay, I mean, yes. this, this might have had some kind of relevance to the world of the 1950s. It is mm -hmm. absolutely none at all today. But they still talk about that. You read all these articles and books and things that are written about all of this. They they do that. They come up with these terrifying plans that we discussed last week, the ones that the US Navy is coming up with. They never think in that kind of way. Um, they never think in terms of having good relations with all countries, allowing other countries to have good relations with each other. They don't see that as good for themselves, which it is, by the way, objectively, if China and the Philippines have good relations, it is objectively good for the United States. I mean, I, I, I would like to say that clearly. They don't see it in that way. They see it always as a zero-sum game in which they're playing, as I said, a complicated chess game with uh, 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 Xi Jinping. It's always Xi Jinping more so, by the way. I mean, everyone else in China hardly matters. Uh, with Xi Jinping in Beijing and, you know, the Philippines or Vietnam or wherever, they're just pieces on this great game that they're playing. Remember, Brzezinski even wrote a book whose title was The Great Game. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And uh, also, um, I think part of the reason EU recently voted uh, in favor of a tariff increase on the Chinese EVs. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. some of the country, probably all of the country, under pressure from the US to do that, mm -hmm. right? That, that's part of that too. But what's interesting is like, I thought that they, they are going to introduce this 35.3%, which is on top of the 10% that's already in place. I thought it crossed the broad, all the EVs. Well, it turns out it's not. So it's not necessarily Chinese cars. It's China-made cars. So, for example, they, they put like 10% on Tesla cars coming from China. That's 10%. But uh, Volkswagen, they put on 21%, 21.3%. So some of the people in China are discussing like, is this? Now, the France, the, Germany is very much against it. France is the one who voted in favor. Um, yeah. So, um, some people are saying, yes, it is the, the bill is against China, you know, want to, to hurt China's EV industry. But there is also some elements of brands want to take advantage of hurting the, the German cars. Do you think there's mm -hmm. some elements of that too? Uh Absolutely. If you know anything about European politics and European history, I don't even mean old European <laughs> politics. The French intensely resent the fact <laughs> that over the last 20 years, they have constantly playing second fiddle to the Germans. This is not how in the French conception the EU was supposed to work at all. It was supposed to be a tandem between Germany and France. And if you go back to its original creation, the first ideas about it by Jean Monnet and people like that, it was going to be something that was going to be led by France. And uh -huh. here are the Germans coming along and they're leading it instead. And the, the, the French absolutely do not like it. This is, by the way, an astonishing decision. First of all, one of the most amazing things about it is that it is a decision which the EU majority forced on Germany. Yeah. Now, this hasn't happened for a long, long time. The Germans nearly always, as far as I know, always up to now, have won when it comes to uh, battles of this kind. And what you see is a um, combination of French politics, French policies, specifically, I mean, Macron, but even other people in France, trying to sort of knock the Germans down. The French know that the German car industry is absolutely critical for Germany's industrial strength, what it, what's left of it. Whereas France, in some ways, has 
a industrial sector which is more diverse, even though it's smaller, and perhaps more resilient. So the French wanted to net knock the Germans down. And the so-called countries of New Europe, in other words, the Baltic states, the East Europeans, yeah. the Scandinavians, all of those people who take orders from Washington, they came together with the French in order to do this to the Germans. The Germans will not be happy. Um, no. And it's going to create serious tensions inside Germany itself. Well, I thought the whole European idea is to kind of resolve this tension between France and Germany. But that tension mm. is still there, isn't it? More or less, it, it's still there, it seems to me. It's, it, it, it has always been there. <laughs> okay. And it will always remain. I mean, <laughs> it waxes and wanes. But mm. at the moment, it's greater than it's been. Partly because of the crisis caused by the Ukraine war. No. which has affected both countries in ways that have made each of them more suspicious of the other. So just just, just to say. So it's always there. As I said, the French basically came up with the idea of the European Union or what became the European Union in the 1950s because they wanted to harness German power, which they always knew was there, in order to... Uh, square off against the British and the Americans, especially the British, because they were very suspicious of the British. Mm -hmm. um, they, then there was a period in the 60s when things were sort of stable. Adenauer and de Gaulle got on pretty well together and um, there was a genuine sense of rapprochement and that continued into the 70s. And then, of course, German reunification came. The French became worried about that. They tried to, to lock the Germans down by creating a centralised Europe. And then to their horror, they discovered that it was the Germans leading it rather than themselves. So th th these tensions have always been there and they will remain there. And the China retaliated to France, even though France is not the only one who voted in favour oh. of that. China retaliated by uh, investigate, conducting investigation of dumping for brandy, you know. Now, yeah. brandy, uh, I didn't know that. It was so important. Um, I didn't know 99% of China's brandy coming from France. So we're talking yeah. about $1.7 billion business and uh, the, mm -hmm. in the neighborhood of 60,000 jobs. So mm -hmm. the interesting thing is what you're saying, that you shouldn't uh, just uh, trying to play these kind of games to, to scare China. Because mm -hmm. when China announces we're going to investigate you know, dumping uh, for brandy, mm -hmm. France was shocked. Apparently, mm -hmm. Macron was shocked because it's such important you know, industry mm. for them. But China made it very clear, we are going to retaliate. So China said no. that ahead of time, but still Macron was shocked and immediately had somebody to contact China to discuss this. Like they were totally unexpected. Yeah. Isn't that strange? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> it, it is, it's remarkable, but then Macron is the most extraordinary man. So a year ago, <laughs> he went off to Beijing, he met Xi Jinping, he comes back saying, this is this is what we must do. We have have this great relationship with China. <laughs> he gives interviews on the plane back home, talking about the wonderful trip he's had to China and the tremendous opportunities that are there. The Americans and the British are unhappy. The Germans at that time also are unhappy. So then he walks it all back. Then a few months ago, he receives Xi Jinping in Paris. Again, he puts on all the show. He has the uh, uh, French troops there in their funny uniforms and their bands and their, <laughs> all of that. And again, apparently thinking that he's going to impress Xi Jinping, which I, I remember at the time we talked about it. I mean, yeah. completely absurd uh, um, thinking. And of course, uh, as soon as Xi Jinping is away, he goes off and he navigates through the European Union, this tough thing, thinking that he's going to hurt the Germans, and then <laughs> discovers to his horror that it's going to result in a retaliation against uh, the cognac, the brandy industry in France. Yeah. Now, can I just say, I know quite a lot about this, because once upon a time, years ago, um, I used to act as lawyer for a wine merchant and okay. a London wine merchant. So I got to know the wine industry very well. And this is, you know, a while back. But even then, 
the importance of the Chinese market, we're talking about decades ago, the Chinese market for the French cognac and brandy industry mm -hmm. simply cannot be <laughs> overstated. Yeah. Uh, it is by far their biggest market. It is, by, it is where they make their profits. Without it, they're doomed. <laughs> How, I mean, you know, it'd be reduced to a small number of producers, big producers, who have the resilience to do this and who are part of big, uh, bigger companies like LVMH, the, you know, the big, mm -hmm. um, I mean, Hennessy is part of that group. Yeah. So, but I mean, you know, the small manufacturers, the small growers, I mean, they'll be obliterated yes. if this yes. happens. I mean, they will be absolutely obliterated. And they are a crucial part of the French wine and agriculture community. And of course, also a key part of the French self-conception and culture. You know, France makes cognac and armagnac and brandy, and it's the best in the world, which, by the way, it's pretty good, but other countries make very good brandies too. Uh, uh, Spain does, Greece does. Germany makes not so good brandy, but it does make it. Armenia makes very good brandy. Um, and by the way, China is perfectly capable of making absolutely yeah. excellent brandy if it wanted to. So, um, you know, it's, it, it is very much part of French society, French culture. And of course, it's important in French politics. I was talking about Jean Monnet, the mm -hmm. man who launched the European Union, who started it all going in the 50s, a brilliant civil servant. He created the Monet Plan, which got the French economy back uh, together and growing again after the Second World War. His wealth was based on cognac. He was a cognac mm -hmm. producer, just, just okay. to say. So this is a seminally important industry in France. Might not be the biggest, uh -huh. might not be the most important, but as you say, thousands of jobs and very much part of the French self-conception. Of course, Macron never gave a micro mi microsecond of thought to the fact that the Chinese might retaliate against it. There we are. They probably thought, again, you know, like you said, you should not think China is bluffing, right? When China said no. we're going to retaliate, China actually no. mean it. But yeah. to, I mean, how many times you have to, I, I just remember like in Australia, mm. I remember when Morrison, right? He he also thought China was bluffing and he followed mm. US to hurt mm. Australia's own interest to sanction China, this and that. And then when China turned around and said, <clears> okay, <throat> we're not going to buy your coal, your wine, your uh, lobster. He was also horrified. He was also like, yeah. couldn't believe that this is happening. I mean, again and again, the, the arrogance of the Western leaders is very, yeah. very stunning to me. In in this particular case, I just thought, I read many times Chinese government said, you know, we actually can, you know, retaliate when you do this, yeah. we are going to. But he still was very shocked. I That's why I say fascinating. It's just incredibly interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, it is incredibly interesting. But, you know, it, as you correctly said, it is the pattern. Um, I mean, in a very small way, I saw this happen in Britain when uh, a, a small group, you know, the small usual clack of people who agitate and complain and protest about China in Britain and constantly um, demand sanctions against China when they were all sanctioned <laughs> by China in response after they managed to get the British government to impose various sanctions and restrictions on China. They were absolutely shocked. Yeah. They couldn't believe that China would do this to them. Um, they've written, I, I, I remember reading all of the articles, the angry articles and the shocked articles. How dare China do this to us? <laughs> what did you expect? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it is, it goes back to what you say, though. Um, Western leaders are very accustomed to thinking of themselves as the masters of the universe. They're able to do whatever they like to others. Um, you know, they do what other you know, they, they do what to others, what they never imagined could ever be done to themselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's something that they haven't yet grasped um, that those days are ended and that the other side, especially if it's China, can and will push back. They, they're still not used to it. They, yeah. No.
No. I mean, uh, to them, to them, it violates natural law. Okay. I mean, you know, the proper order of things, the world turned the right way up is for them to sanction others and for the others to sit back and tremble and say, oh, yeah, we're going to do whatever you want. Uh, a, a world in which they get sanctioned in response is the world turned upside down and they can't imagine, can't imagine it or accept it. But it's very frustrating for Chinese government because the Chinese government is telling them these are the things we're going to do. But they don't yeah. they totally ignore it. They don't take it seriously until no. it happens, until the action, you know, took place. And then they were like shocked. And then they yeah. come back saying, you know, can you not do this and that? Well, then it's too late. I mean, <laughs> I find it staggering because, like mm -hmm. you said, that the brand industry is so important for cognac is so important for France. France mm -hmm. right now, the cognac has 99% of the Chinese brandy market, which make it impossible for anybody else to come in. So mm -hmm. they have a very unique control of uh, Southern China. In particular, Southern China seems like that's a big thing. The, the cognac yeah. is a big thing. What they do now is self-destructing because once China started doing this, then other competitors yeah. will see opportunities. That's their opportunities, uh, including like a bourbon. The U.S. have bourbon, you know, not so much brandy, but bourbon. And I actually was talking to a friend not that long ago. I said, I don't see that many, that much bourbon in the Chinese market. How come is that? And he just said, mm. well, it's hard. It's hard for, for anybody other than a cognac to come in. And they mm. are self-destructing, isn't it? <laughs> this is exactly, well, this is exactly right. But again, to remark, to say it again, I mean, bourbon is a whiskey. Uh, okay. Brandy is a wine based thing. I mean, they, 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 they are both spirits. They're not that different. Yeah. Just, just to say, I mean, whiskey just to say whiskey became established in England in the late 19th century because there was mm -hmm. a crisis in the French wine industry in the 19th century because there was a plague which mm -hmm. called, caused all the vineyards to die. So the English at that time were looking for an alternative and they came up with whiskey, which then became refined okay. and basically replaced cognac in London. Uh, this is in the late 19th century. You see, it can happen. Whiskey can take the place of cognac. Um, it's, as I said, a history for all kinds of reasons I know very well. Um, but, I mean, there are other cognac and brandy producers too. Um, the dominance that France has in this is based more on history than quality. I'm not saying that French brandy isn't exceptionally good but other countries spain especially also yeah. make exceptional brandy the sherry producers in spain make exceptional brandy maybe the chinese won't want to go there but you know they could find other places armenia makes exceptional bra uh -huh. brandy the caucasus uh, countries make exceptional brandy too anyway anywhere that you grow grapes you can make brandy just just to say um if you look at the prices of French brandy, they are enormous. You know, mm -hmm. a, a bottle of Richard Hennessy, just one bottle, would cost around $10,000. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, uh, why are those prices possible? Because of the enormous demand in China. <laughs> that, that, that is what drives up prices of brandy. If brandy was if French brandy was priced at more, shall we say, uh, measured levels, because it didn't have this huge captive market to draw upon, then, as I said, all of the producers would go bankrupt. All the small producers would go bankrupt. It's as simple as this. If I were a French farmer, I'll be frustrated. I'll be ballistic. Well, they, like they, would, they, they will be furious about this. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and there will be a political effect mm -hmm. as well. Bear in mind that already Macron and his government are unpopular in much of rural France. This uh -huh. will be seen not just in the Cognac and Armagnac regions, but right across France, in all the wine growing regions, and every French region grows wine to some extent or other. It, it will be seen by them as further proof that the political class in Paris, 
isn't interested in them, doesn't care about them, uh, is entirely focused on some great geostrategy of its own. Bear in mind that these people aren't uh, interested in a quarrel with China no. anyway. Uh, to the extent that they have any hostility towards anyone, it tends to be more towards the Americans and the British and the Germans and people of that kind closer to home. Yeah, like you said, I think Macron is kind of interesting. I mean, he seems mm. like a smart guy and from mm. time to time he does say something sensible, but then he just turns around and and do something and say something really stupid. I, I can't mm. try, quite understand him either. Just, you yeah. know. Well, I, 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 I think it's a waste of time trying to. I, I mean, if I can just go back a little, back in 2022, before the war in Ukraine began, mm -hmm. he visited Moscow. The Russians yeah, I remember had that. hours, yeah, yeah. hours mm -hmm. of discussion with him. And, you know, this was said publicly, so this isn't a secret. And um, he kept Putin up late into the night. And apparently he was coming up with all sorts of, you know, grand words and plans and schemes and things. And Putin would say, would say to him repeatedly, yes, but what exactly is your proposal? And he would never come up with that one. And that is Macron. He's very, very good at, you know, spinning great grand stories. But he's never really someone who sits down and looks at things in a practical way. Uh, speak of practical way. Okay, so uh, Israel foreign minister has he he called he actually asked the Wang Yi to call him. So he contacted Wang Yi. So Wang, Wang Yi had uh, had a conversation with him, a phone conversation, mm -hmm. and that happened on the fourteenth October fourteenth, the ten eleven in the evening, mm -hmm. and almost right after that, the eleven oh six, right based on the readout. So Wang Yi called the Iranian foreign minister. Yeah. Uh, Arachi, I think that's his name. Yeah. Uh, so clearly, it's Israel is asking China to pass along some message. Is that how you yes. interpret it? Um, what what message does Israel want China to pass along? Right. What I think what has happened is that Israel has been moving um, all out for war against Iran. And, you know, they'd attacked Hezbollah, they'd assassinated Nasrallah, they'd launched the pager attack, they'd done all kinds of things. The Israeli army has entered Lebanon, was fighting and not apparently gaining, doing very much, gaining very much ground. But anyway, that's another story. And then what happened, even as the euphoria and, you know, the confidence was you know, bubbling up to the surface, what then happened is that Iran launched its missile strike. All over the media now, the Financial Times, the Daily Telegraph in Britain, many places in the United States, it's suddenly acknowledged that most of the missiles actually, the Iranian missiles actually got through. I'm hearing a report that up to 36 hit one Israeli airbase, the one at Nevatim, which is an important airbase. And yesterday, or was it the day before yesterday, a, a critically important article in the Financial Times admitting that Israel is out or almost out of air defense missiles and that the United States isn't able to supply more. So Israel suddenly discovers, my God, the Iranians are much more powerful in military technology than we expected. And the Americans can't step in and help us. Mm -hmm. And if it, we find ourselves in a long-term war with Iran, we are going to be exposed to devastating counter-strikes by Iran that we can't counter. So two weeks now, more than two weeks since the Iranian strike, the Israelis promised a strike. The credibility of Prime Minister Netanyahu and his, the stability of his government depend on Israel carrying out some kind of a strike against Iran because they said that that was what they were going to do. And I think their supporters expect them to do it. They don't want to be in a long war. At the same time, they now know that Iran can hit back and hit back hard. So what I think they're trying to do is they want to carry out some kind of a strike, but they also want the Iranians not to respond 
too strongly to it. It's the usual story. So how do they get around this? How do they do that? They contact the Chinese, who they know are good friends with the Iranians. By the way, they've also been contacting the Russians. And they're trying to say, look, we're going to carry out a strike, but it's not going to be quite the big bad strike that we intended at the beginning. We're going to try and do a smaller, precise, lethal, surprising strike. Um, when we do it, can you please not attack us in the way that perhaps you might have done? And if you do that, we'll, we'll, we'll try and walk away from this whole horrible business. I, I think that is what is going on. I think that is what the Americans... And the Israelis are trying to convey to the Iranians. Now, whether the Iranians are going to listen is, of course, another matter. Mm. Whether the Chinese or the Russians are impressed, I think, is another matter again. Um, but anyway, I think that is what the Israelis are trying to say. Well, but um, I guess the reason they contacted both China and Russia is because they want to convince the Iranians, right? Because they, they yeah. don't believe only the U.S. pass along the information the Iranian will buy buy them? Is that what, why? Because in the past, well, I uh, thought, right? Go ahead. No, no, you're completely right. I mean, the Americans have been passing information backwards and forwards between Iran and uh -huh. Israel, and they've been doing it through the Iranian embassy in Qatar. Qatar has okay. been acting as the sort of, you know, uh -huh. conveyor of all of this. Um, but you're absolutely right. American credibility with Iran has completely collapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iranian president, who spoke to, of all people, Macron, he said this very straightforwardly. Look, when the Hamas chief, Haniyeh, was assassinated in Tehran on the very same day that I was inaugurated president of Iran, we were going to strike back. But then the Americans came and the Europeans too. And they came and told us, no, don't, don't strike at Israel because mm -hmm. we are going to negotiate a ceasefire in Gaza. And um, if you strike at Israel, that will prevent that ceasefire from being agreed. So don't do that, hold back. And the Iranians talked about it, talked about it with, each, with themselves. And they decided that that was what they were going to do. And instead of there being a ceasefire in Gaza, what they got was the pager attack, the yeah. attacks on uh, uh, Hezbollah, the advance into southern Lebanon, the assassination of Nasrallah. So, of course, they don't believe. And you know, this is actually there. It's in the Iranian reader of the conversation with, um, with Macron. The Iranians <laughs> don't believe what the Americans are telling them anymore, or the Europeans are telling them anymore. Whereas, by contrast, China, above all, Russia, to a certain extent, are Iran's friends. China, uh, Iran is going to be meeting with the leaders of these countries in, I think it's two weeks' time, in Kazan. Yeah. So what the Chinese and the Russians say carries credibility. But, of course, what the Chinese and the Russians themselves believe now is another yeah. matter. Yeah. Well, I don't believe them. I mean, no. I live in the United States. What what Biden just, uh, I mean, they just reported mm. that the saying Blinken and uh, I think uh, somebody else, they jointly said that, OK, Israel, you need to give a humanitarian, you know, get that humanitarian aid into Gaza. Uh, within 30 days, otherwise, you know, after 30 days, we're doing, you know, we're going to have a, some kind of weapon embargo or something. Nobody believes it. No, I don't believe I it. Don't. No, no. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. I mean, it's absolute. It's absolutely. It's absolutely ridiculous. When they say things like that, um, I mean, you just know that they're talking nonsense and that they don't even believe it themselves. I mean, they're lying again. They're always lying. And when yeah. you lie all the time, in the end, nobody believes anything you say. I think Austin is and uh, Blinken. Uh, do you think they they said that now? Thirty days notice. Thirty days is after the election, so they are trying. Mm. They're they're still trying to get some Arab votes. Is that what they're doing? This no. and making that yeah. okay without mm. promising, <clears throat> without needing to to deliver, because then it will be after the election. That's what they're doing. Yes, is that right? I, I, that's exactly right. The trouble is, I don't think those Arab voters in Michigan and elsewhere yeah. believe them either anymore. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, also, I always want to ask you this question. <clears throat> well, there, there's so many conflicts going on, right? It, including what's going on in Ukraine. And the, clearly, to me, it's like a war everywhere. <clears throat> but when I look at it, none of them really declared war. So why yeah. is that? Even in Ukraine, it's called a special military operation, right? <clears throat> in, in, in Gaza, it's either fighting terrorists or defend yourself, you know, what have you. So what's the difference uh, when you declare a war versus you don't declare war why are they well, not declaring war <laughs> well that's it that that is an excellent question it's one i get asked all the time by the way by <laughs> lots of people and it's a very good one um basically the concept of the declaration of war basically ended with the second world war because in theory the only party that is legally entitled to declare war on behalf of any state is the Security Council of the United Nations. If you go to chapter yeah. seven, it is the United Nations, the Security Council, that has the sole right to take that kind of action. That was the idea that all mm -hmm. the great powers agreed to um, at the end of the Second World War. Now, what the, what the UN Charter also says is that um, any country can take action to defend itself in its own self-defense until the Security Council takes action. So what they're all doing, in theory, the, the, the way they try to stay on the right side of the law is that they try to conduct wars without declaring war, operating <laughs> under the fiction that eventually the Security Council will step in <laughs> and, uh, uh, and act in their place. So that way they can all say that they're acting in an entirely legal way without actually doing so. I mean, it's, it's, it's the reality of the world today. In, in, in the case of the Russians, they called it a special military operation precisely in order to avoid using the word war. And when um, China and India both refer to it as a war, which of course it is, the, 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 the Russians said, oh, no, 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 you mustn't do that. <laughs> this isn't actually a war. It's only a special military operation. The Chinese, by the way, I've noticed, have paid no attention. <laughs> and then they do refer to it as a war, which is what it is. Well, then in that case, in the future, nobody would declare war then. I mean, you don't have no. any benefit to declare war, I mean, right? Well, <laughs> well, that's right. That is absolutely, I mean, it, it actually, if anything, uh, reduces the threshold. Because the, if you're talking about the pre-1945 uh, mechanism, the idea was that you set out your demands, you back those demands with an ultimatum, you said, if you don't agree to my demands, then we will be at war. And if the other side, the side that was presented with the ultimatum, didn't agree to those demands, then you would come and formally declare war. So that that was the that was the sort of legal process that had evolved over time. Now, of course, nobody presents ultimatums or makes demands in that kind of way, and we just go ahead to war. Except we don't call it that. Um, the other thing I notice is that um, there is an article on the Guardian. The, the The title says Israel is a rogue nation; it should yeah. be removed. From the United Nations. This is a uh, Mehdi Hassan who wrote that. I'm a little bit surprised that an article like that would get published, yeah. but I do agree with what he said. I'm I'm not a big fan of Mehdi Hassan, by the way. But yeah. anyway, I I do agree with the, some of the things he said. That he said that Israel's attack on the UN personnel is unprecedented. I I do notice that too, yeah. including just yeah. recently they attacked the Lebanon UN mm. peace, peacekeeping forces. There are some Chinese in there. That's again, got lots of attention in China mm. because mm. years ago there was somebody, there, there is a Chinese got killed in, I think Lebanon, um, part of the uh, UN peacekeep, peacekeeping forces. I think not only the UN personnel got unprecedented attack by Israel, mm. but also journalists, reporters, or somebody did some research so, you know, showing um, ever since October 7th, which is a year ago, mm -hmm. there, there mm -hmm. has been more, like almost twice as many reporters being killed than the whole 20 years of Vietnam. Um, mm -hmm. That's staggering numbers. Like, 
So why Israel so doesn't care anything any anyway anymore? I mean, it doesn't even seem care whether you're a reporter or your UN peacekeeper. It doesn't care anything anymore. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I should say I agree with you about Mehdi, Mehdi Hassan. I'm not a fan of his either. That is the first thing to say. Um, mm -hmm. th the second thing to say is that Israel is not going to be expelled from the United Nations, <laughs> but it is behaving in exactly the way he says. It is absolutely out of control mm -hmm. and it is simply ignoring all restraints or legal or moral restraints as well. And the fact that someone like Mehdi Hassan is now writing articles like this shows you how bad this behavior by Israel has become. Because he's not normally the sort of person you'd expect mm -hmm. to be uh, writing articles of this kind. And it's also the case that it's surprising in a way that The Guardian of all places is publishing things yeah, like this. Yeah, I was remember Jonathan, mm -hmm. I mean, remember Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Friedland, who's a major... Uh, writer for The Guardian, is an outspoken supporter for Israel, and he's a major editorial writer for The Guardian as well. So it just shows you how bad the behaviour is. Now, the reason it has become so bad, the reason it's become so reckless and dangerous and extremely violent, the reason Israel is able to attack UN personnel and kill people, kill people from China and all, all sorts of places in the world and behave with incredible aggressive rudeness towards the UN and its agencies is because they know that whatever they do, the United States and the Western countries will support it. And that there is no real limit to what it can do because whatever it does however bad its behavior is it will continue to get that support so that of course nearly encourages israel to go further and further and further we saw this again after the attack after the assassination the murder of ismail haniya in tehran what did the Western powers do? They criticized Iran for threatening yeah. Israel. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, uh, when you have something like that going on all the time, you have no you, you, you have no incentive beyond your own conscience to hold back. And of course, if you start committing crimes, then of course your conscience gradually shrill you know sh shrivels uh, and uh, you know you have to just keep going because that is the nature of crime once you've started on that course you the compulsion is always to continue and to to do it even more and to go go in deeper uh, another big thing is the Nobel Prize. I want to talk to you about the Nobel Prize. It got a lot of attention. It, it used yeah. to be uh, mainly the Peace Prize. That is very controversial. I think this yeah. year, every category seems to have some problem. <laughs> so let's start with the uh, physics and chemistry. So uh, Jeffrey Hinton, I think that's his name, is uh, one yeah. of the phys physical uh, prize yeah. winner. So he is a computer scientist. He's not a physicist. He is a very uh, accomplished uh, computer scientist and he got lots of award and this and that. Even he himself was surprised when he got the phone call. So I guess the, the committee's reasoning for that is because they have been uh, doing some AI stuff and then that AI helped to create something. And the same thing with chemistry. Chemistry downright just give two of the winners. They are Google engineers. So they are definitely really not chemists. Mm. So again, it's an AI uh, something they did in the AI sphere that created something. Mm. Now, if you use that, that's what, where the discussion is. You know, the controversy in the at least uh, among Chinese netizens is that, well, in that case, you 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 can just give all your award to computer scientists. You know, to give to engineers. You don't need to mm. give the physicist and the chemist. And there is even people saying, you know, maybe in the future, uh, it will be AI uh, who get the award. You don't even give it to humans. <laughs> <laughs> What's your take on that? <laughs> well, I mean, actually, this is a longer story, an older story than I think people even in China fully understand, because it, it, it was already an established pattern during the Cold War. So the Soviet Union made a lot of scientific achievements. You know, it did. I mean, it was 
at the forefront in laser technologies, in all kinds of fields in mathematics, indeed, by the way, in early computer science, in nuclear engineering. It started the space program. If you look at the number of Nobel Science Prizes awarded to Soviet scientists, they were tiny, were far fewer than a middle-ranking British or American university. The way in which they the science prizes were awarded, disproportionately, they went to English-speaking scientists in principally the United States, but also, by the way, to a great degree in Britain as well. And this pattern is now reproducing itself, but it's becoming more extreme because back in the 50s and 60s, the Soviets were certainly effective and important in science, but you could still genuinely argue that the greater amount of scientific activity and the most important breakthroughs at that time were still happening in the West. Not necessarily because the scientists were better, but because the resources were so much greater that they could take their research further than the Soviet scientists could. That is no longer the case today. Um, China can match any science that is being done anywhere in the West. It has resources that are at least equal to it, to the West. In science, so but I mean, Russia is also starting to come back in the world of science, not to the same degree, but it's there. So, Western scientific dominance, to the extent that it's existed at all in the last fifty years, has reduced. But of course, you can't admit this. So, I, I was reading articles a few weeks ago at the Daily Telegraph and other places still talking about how the West has extraordinary degree of scientific leadership, how China can't compete there. It's always China. I, I stress again, it is always ultimately China. Now, you can't find a genuine physicist, so you come up with a computer engineer. You can't find a genuine chemist. You say you come up with a, a, another a, a computer engineer. You say, well, it's all to do with AI. But then, of course, you could have... A, other prizes for that too as I said, AI ultimately is part of the world of computing of yeah. course the Chinese are pretty good at AI as well but you know all of that so you, the point is it's a little bit like the Olympic Games oh. America must always win if it can't win in the accepted known sports well you just go on adding more more sports so that they can continue to uh, uh, uh you can continue to win and you can use all kinds of other mechanisms to make sure that they come out top of the metal table tables as well it's exactly the same thing personally i don't think the chinese people should be too bothered about the Nobel prizes i mean this is this is old european stuff it was set up you know before the first world war by a swedish chemist <laughs> who created explosives and all of that at a time when the europeans were the center of the uh, world mm -hmm. um when china was fighting for its life under the blows of the european col colonialists and the japanese um when you know most of the world outside china that wasn't european was under the rule of the colonial empires. That world is gone. And taking seriously a prize awarded by a couple of people in Stockholm is, is nonsense now. Um, high time that China focused on its own prizes, publicized its own scientists, did its own work, offered its prizes internationally. That would certainly attract attention uh, 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 and change the rules of the game on this too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a. We always know that the Peace Prize is very political, and then mm -hmm. later I think the the literature is also become more and more political, mm -hmm. and now it seems like mm -hmm. physics, chemistry, it's just all the categories. <laughs> seems Absolutely, like. I mean, it, it, it's always been so. I mean, again, going back to the fifties, um, the the Americans got their hands on Boris Pasternak's uh, uh, manuscript of Doctor Zhivago. Without asking, without without telling him, 
they got it translated into English. The CIA did it. And within a month, it had been presented to the Nobel uh, Committee, which granted Pasternak the, no the Nobel Literature Prize. I mean, you know, all of all of this done without his knowledge, without his agreement. The Soviets were absolutely furious. Pasternak himself got into trouble. It was all arranged. And again, what it showed was who really runs the Nobel Prize. And that was in the 50s, mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the, the, the control has, if anything, increased even further since then. And as you say, it's all political. All of it is politics now. Nothing, nothing happens without that kind of interference, which is really so sad because, yeah. you know, it. it totally contrary to the intentions of Alfred Nobel, who was the founder. Yeah, yeah the literature is another controversial one uh, this year. Absolutely. The, this author, uh, Han Kong, um, I'm sure she's a nice person. But when I look at the books she wrote, um, the two one that most prominent one, is, one is called The Human Acts, which is to describing uh, this the uprising, uh, Guangzhou uprising that happened in Korea. And that book was banned in Korea for quite some time. Yeah. Now the book was talking about the survivors of those uh, people of the that uprising. Mm -hmm. uh, she mm -hmm. was talking about like I saw an interview that she has was like eleven percent of the people who survived that they they committed suicide, which is much higher mm -hmm. suicide rate than the general public. Mm -hmm. uh, she's she's in the book is talking about the trauma, etc. I'm sure it's a it's a good book, but again, it's also a book that is. Con controversial in South Korea. Okay, so they have to find a book that is political, that is controversial. They cannot mm -hmm. find any other thing that that can be just purely literature, you know, nice no. literature. I mean, I can no. I can find plenty of Chinese uh, authors <laughs> that wrote, you know, beautiful books and etc. But they they have to find somebody who's controversial. And and then the vegetarian is another book that she wrote. Even more, I find very strange. It's a it's about somebody who had many days of horrible dreams and then decided one day she wanted to be a vegetarian. Mm. And then be, because of that, she got isolated by her surroundings. Everybody thought she was strange. I'm mm. not even sure it's true. I think vegetarian in China, in the, the, the people that I thought, mainland in Taiwan, I know a bunch of mm. vegetarians. Malaysia, Indonesia, of course, a lot of Indians. I don't see anybody get isolated by their family for being vegetarian. So it's simply not true. And yet that book, very weird book, uh, also very controversial by a lot of uh, uh, Koreans for various reasons. So uh, an author like that got the award. Isn't that very yeah, strange? Know. Well, it's very strange. And I mean, the fact that China's not received more Nobel prizes mm -hmm. for literature given i mean anybody i mean i you know i'm not familiar with chinese literature my wife is a bit more than me i mean modern mm -hmm. chinese literature but i know that it exists in huge quantities and a lot of it is absolutely outstanding i mean my my wife has had contacts in chinese universities she's um um been a guest to one mm -hmm. to one of the big universities in hangzhou I mean, she has contacts there. She's been commenting about this for years, by the way. So, I mean, already this is ridiculous. Now, I, I, about the book on Korea, I would agree with you. About the book on vegetarianism in China, I have to say it surprises me because I know a little about Chinese culture, as your uh, netizens, your, 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 your viewers know. And I happen to know that China has a huge history of vegetarianism. I mean, there's yeah. there's one of the very most famous restaurants in Beijing. I don't know if it still exists. was called the Gundaling, which was entirely vegetarian. Well, and it goes yeah. big. It goes back, I mean, decades, probably probably before before uh, uh you know all, all the way to the 19th century i mean i don't know how long but anyway vegetarianism is a very well known thing in china yeah. it, it is very well established for all sorts of cultural and theological reasons connected with buddhism taoism and all sorts of things of that kind um that somebody would feel isolated by becoming a vegetarian in china really does surprise me actually um, yeah. Maybe things have changed, but I mean, I don't understand that at all. Yeah, that, that's why I don't, this is in Korea, but I just don't believe that people mm. in Korea who become vegetarian will be become some kind of a Mariah, you know, by... by well, the, exactly. I mean, yeah. well, if you've, been to, if you've been to Korea or to South Korea, which I have done, mm -hmm. um, again, um, a society where Buddhism is very well established, 
extremely well established, where Chinese influence is very strong. Yeah, I can't imagine <laughs> that vegetarianism and things of that kind are not well known in Korea as well. I mean, I don't know much about that because I'm not as so familiar with Korean culture. But I mean, again, these these are uh, Westerners might there might be problems with becoming a vegetarian in the west there are by the way i mean i know that again from my wife though less so obviously now uh, but historically there used to be western society was very meat eating oriented but east asian society i just cannot believe that i mean they have the familiarity with vegetarianism which is millennial <laughs> to say it simply to say it as simple as that yeah and then so the the, of course, the, the Chinese netizens, the comments about that is the Nobel Committee just like people who are troublemakers. They just want your yeah. book to be controversial. They they don't yeah. really I, care I, about the literature part of it, right? I think that's fair enough. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Pro probably they're not able to uh, make mm. objective assessments of literary quality. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, I, I don't know how long this person has been writing. Yeah. But, you know, once upon a time, you had to be a, a writer for decades. You had to produce a huge amount of high quality writing, be hugely well regarded by other people in the literary world before you were considered for a Nobel Literature Prize. That doesn't seem to be true anymore. No. Yeah. If you like the one Chinese author, uh, Mo Yan, he, who got the Nobel Prize, He's also very controversial in China because he's mm. in his book. I read, I, I didn't read that many. Mm. I read a little bit. It just makes me very uncomfortable be, because his book is always about how backwards, how poor, how strange lots of the Chinese, you know, habits yeah. and tradition is. It's kind of like a yeah. smear, almost like a smear about China. You know, why yeah. does the, the only person they could pick is him? They couldn't pick anybody else, you know, literature. Well, exactly. Well, exactly. I mean, I, I, I think that's exactly correct. I mean, you know, I think that is true. I think they do like troublemakers, provided, yeah. of course, they're not Western troublemakers. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and then the uh, the same thing with the Peace uh, Award. Now, this is a grass grassroots organization that they are anti uh, nuclear war, which is good. Uh, I, I I mean, but uh, it's also a a group of people who also created troubles for the Japanese uh, government because they have been asking the Japanese government to give compensations for the survivors of the atomic bombs. Now, I don't think anything wrong with that. I think they should right. do that. But if your message based on the Nobel Prize, their own saying, their message is they want people to, of course, to, to be anti-nuclear war. Now, if you want to do that, there are many other good organizations that they should have given the award I think the most mm. prominent one uh, is what I can think is that in 1967, South American countries, they had a treaty um, that basically saying we're not going to develop or deploy or do any of nuclear weapons in our territory. There are 33 countries signed to it. Mm. It's a treaty of something. Yeah. Um, and that treaty not only um, apply to those countries, they themselves don't develop any nuclear weapons. They also ask the nuclear powers to promise not to attack any of those members within mm -hmm. that territory, which I really think it's a remarkable thing that they've done. And so far, nobody has violated that terms. Mm -hmm. How come something like that, that treaty never get any award, right? Isn't it? Well, because it's far away from the West <laughs> and it doesn't concern the West and they're not worried about it. So they're not interested in it. They will support a nuclear anti-nuclear movement in Japan, which demands compensation for the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki from the Japanese government, would they do so if it was demanding compensation for the survivors from the American government, which was, after all, the government that actually dropped the bombs? Just saying. I mean, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, as you rightly say, it's an anti-nuclear movement. Perhaps it's a less... Um, bizarre reward than some of the others that they made in recent years so we should be grateful for that but that it, it seems to me that we are talking again about allowed or permitted opposition as mm -hmm. opposed to real opposition and uh, agreements that other countries 
come to with each other to avoid the use of nuclear weapons. They're not so interesting to the West mm. if they are made without the West. If the Americans had been involved and had broken this agreement, then any, the American official who was responsible for doing it would have been awarded the Nobel Prize. Okay. And also in terms of Japan, you know, it's always there are very strong feelings in China. And this group, I think, also controversial in, in particular in China is because in China, people don't see the atomic bombs under that. There are that many innocent people. Actually, that's the no. view. Now, part no. of it is because at the time, Japan was crazy. There, you know, the, the whole no. Japan was very much into this uh, um, militarism. I mean, they were well documented in their, in their own newspaper. If you read at the time, they would report things like, oh, a young couple got married and the man will go to China, certainly to go kill Chinese. And the woman feel like, uh, and then the man said, okay, I'm going to leave now and then I'll come back for you. And then the woman, in order to support her husband, mm -hmm. would, would uh, commit suicide in order for her to support her husband full, full hearted to go to China to kill people. So when you see these kind of stories, I actually think that that's probably the view. Now, I know in a lot of, in the West, a lot of people thinking that the nuclear bombs uh, killed lots of innocent people. That's not the view in China. Lots of most, I would say, most of the Chinese people think that there isn't that many innocent people at the time in in Japan. That's the view. I, okay. I can un I can understand that. I can completely <laughs> understand that, given what yeah. happened and what many Japanese have told me, and they've told they've talked to me about the atmosphere of psychosis that existed mm -hmm. in Japan before and during the Second World War. So, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that they think that way. Yeah. And then the economy, and, you know, we probably talked about this in the past too. I think mm. that the biggest achievement, you know, by the Chinese government, I really think the Chinese government deserve uh, the Nobel Prize in the economy, right? But they will <laughs> never receive that. <laughs> so it's always giving to Westerners, right? Again. <laughs> of course, absolutely. I, I, I cannot imagine any Chinese economist, especially if he's an economist who works in one of the central planning agencies, <laughs> being awarded a Nobel Prize. That's, awful. That's inconceivable. You know, all kinds of theory, theoretical economists who, you know, discuss all sorts of, you know, uh, what, what the effect on money is of this yes. kind of derivative. Those sort of people get prizes, but, you know, real economists who actually make hundreds of millions of people, poor people, into rich people. <laughs> you see, you don't talk about them, especially if they're in China. After all, we all know that the reason China was became rich was because it stole everything from the US. <laughs> that's the that's the narrative that you want to promote at the moment. And I think, you know, the, the China, China, within the Chinese government, they are poverty alleviation, you know, agencies. They are agencies, yeah. the sole focus is to, for that. Yeah. I do, I do think they do a great job. It's not just a good economic model that you can learn, but also I think it's good for peace. Isn't it making people, lifting people out of poverty? I think it's good for peace. Don't you agree? It is the, it is the most important and best thing for peace. Um, mm -hmm. um, Mahatma Gandhi once said that the greatest violence is poverty. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think he was absolutely right. Um, a government that prioritizes prioritizes the ending of poverty is by definition a good government which has secured peace and fought violence but you know that is as many people in the west would say an east asian point of view yeah. okay okay uh, bricks so they're they're going to have a meeting soon i think in the week yeah. time in kazan right so the biggest thing is the BRICS payment system. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your take on that? I mean, again, we, we talked about a little bit in the past. It's not going mm -hmm. to replace dollar, but they are very seriously going to put into a payment system that is, at least we can say, it's an alternative to SWIFT, right? Is, is that what you're yeah. going to do? It's yes, that, that, 
I mean, this is this is uh, again to use the Chinese expression. I mean, it's the it's the journey of a thousand leagues, and you have to start with the single step, which is yeah. often the most difficult. I think what we're going to get in Kazan is the first big step, and the first big step is to set up a unified messaging system, or at least not a unified messaging system, but one which works between all of these various countries. Yeah. And I think the next step will probably be some kind of payment system that not only bypasses SWIFT, but which is also seen as sanction-proofed, so that we'll probably see, see transfers being made on behalf of companies via central banks, the, the BRICS central banks, as opposed to you know the Western system where banks are able to do it without the central banks being directly involved. It'll be a more complicated system initially, but then over time, as the new system starts to crystallize, it will get stronger and it will be more centralized. It will not have the control at a, a single point in the way that the basically the Federal Reserve Board controls everything, because if you're going to have to transfer funds from one country to another, you have to open accounts with the Fed in New York and things mm. of that kind. So it, 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 it's going to be a big journey, but I think they're going to make the, big, the first big step um, in Kazan. And I, understand, I haven't read it, but I understand that the Russian chair has re released a paper, a big paper, which gives some insight into what they're working upon. And can I just say it's a collective paper? Um, it, it, it involves, uh, um, you know, it isn't just, just the Russians. Um, but I, I understand that it's a very, very carefully judged and thought out and realistic document. And, you know, I, I, I've seen the way the Chinese carry out planning. I've seen the way the Russians do. And they, they do tend to work in a very systematic and methodical way, one step at a time. They don't like to get from point, they don't think they can get from point A to point Z <laughs> immediately. But I, you know, the, the first step is often, is always the most difficult. Yeah. And I think they will cross that. Um, they, will, they will take that first step in Kazan. I think that's going to be the main point issue of discussion, by the way. Yeah. I, I think it's good to always have choices for countries, right? For yeah. for trade. Um, one thing I didn't realize, I which I find there's really little discussion in, in the in the mm. you know, mainstream media, is that uh, Russia also wants uh, commodity trade to control that part of it. So so far. The commodity trade mainly is controlled by uh, Chicago Board of Trade, um, and uh, yeah. including lots of the like grains and stuff like that, right? So one thing Russia seems interested in is kind of like having a trade board uh, for, let's say, grain. Now yeah. that will have comp you know implications because now commodities prices is kind of tricky. Of, of course, it's a supply and demand, but it's also because like uh, the trade Chicago yeah. Trade Board. They also they trade commodity future, so they have impact of the pricing of the commodity too yeah. because they trade future. Now, if the if and of course it's a it's dollar uh, denominated, so if if and and that giving them a power, yeah. you know the the, the trade uh, trade board at uh, the power. So now Russia wants it to be more in control of that. So if 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 BRICS also have some kind of a trading board for commodity. Yeah. That will give you know Russia and, and uh, I think BRICS in general combined power. Now that will actually have implications for the U.S. farm products. Agriculture is a big sector in the U.S., isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, it is. Um, the the thing to understand is, I mean, the the, the, the Chicago board, the the role the U.S. has in determining food prices, wheat prices, oil prices, these mm -hmm. are all legacies of the way in which the American economy developed in the late 19th century. In the late 19th century, I, I should say again, uh, I have actually family history here because one of my ancestors uh, who became extremely rich was a grain merchant. Okay. He, 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 yeah, this is in the 19th century. In um, He was based in London. He made a huge fortune, basically 
uh, brokering sales of grain from the United States and bringing them to Europe and to Britain. And he used uh, part of the money that he made to build the Orthodox Cathedral, Greek Orthodox Cathedral here in London. But anyway, the point is the Americans, the Americans were central to the whole system at that time, yeah. just as they were central to the whole oil export sector, because the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century was the main oil exporter. And then it became the, male, the main oil importer, or at least the main place where oil was consumed. So it made sense to, look, to base all of these things in the United States. But these are legacies, <laughs> just as, by the way, the metals, the metals exchange, which controls m many metals prices, is based in London, yeah. again, as a, ho uh, a historic overhang from the time when the British basically were the people who traded in metals. So it makes complete sense that a country that is now the world's biggest commodities producer, uh, that produces oil, wheat, metals, energy, other types of energy, all of those things, says, look, the time has come to shift this all away from yeah. the Anglo-Americans, especially, as you absolutely correctly say, that having these boards in these places or these, uh, you know, sectors in these places, located in these places, affects the price. It means that the actual price of oil and the price of grain is to a great extent going to be shaped by what is decided in London and New York and Chicago and those sort of places. So it makes complete sense that they would do that. And it would have happened anyway in time. I mean, eventually, it would have. that's where we would have come to. And again, it, it, it makes sense also to do it within the framework of the BRICS. BRICS brings together the world's biggest manufacturer by far, which is China. It being, brings together the biggest commodities producer, which is Russia. It produce, it brings a lot of the oil exporters together. So obviously it makes sense that they should try to work together to wrest control of all of these things away from the Anglo-Americans. Rest control is the word we have to use now because all of this is being resisted the better way would have been if all of these institutions that had existed previously had simply been allowed to democratize and evolve by themselves into something globally more equitable but the western powers unsurprisingly refused to let that happen and it's completely understandable that the BRICS states will do it. And as you rightly say, if it happens, it will have profound implications on the way in which the world works. Yeah, and the agriculture is a big sector, right, in the United States. Oh, and yeah. so, A is... huge sector, but a yeah. declining one. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, what? because again, I, I have contact with people who are in it. And one of the problems, apparently, is that it's very, very difficult to find young people were prepared uh -huh. to work on the farms anymore so that the age uh the, the farmers are becoming much older um it's apparently most of them are now in their 60s and uh, the you know there isn't a generation uh following them and it's not quite as strong and healthy a sector as it once was well the the u.s government even uh many times mm -hmm. they even making it even more difficult. I remember uh, Robert was on your show talking about this Amish farmer, Amos That's Miller. Right, yeah. yeah, they were harassing him, right? And yeah. he's not alone. There were some other cases yeah. in the Midwest and et cetera. The government just uh, making it very hard and difficult for the farmers and, and you know, sometimes impossible for various well, reasons. Correct. Yeah. Correct, absolutely. I mean, it, and, I mean it's, it's, it's becoming over-concentrated. It's becoming very corporate. It, mm -hmm. It's losing its way. But as you rightly said, it is still a big sector, uh, relatively speaking, in the economy. And going back to saying that the, the legacies, which is another reason which I find is still fascinating, that since there are so many things working to the Western favor, in particular Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. favor, 
why do they want to change the status quo? You see, they are the one of all the people should be the one really want to keep everything the way it is. But they can't. They have to have the wars here, sanction there, and making it impossible for the people to working, to function in the system that they built, that they benefit from. It's fascinating, that, isn't it? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sophia, for saying that. I've been trying to make this very same point to all sorts of people in London and in New York for years now. I mean, since you are the great beneficiaries of the system as yes. it exists, why on earth do you want to change it? Why do you want to explode everything and destabilize everything when what you have works so well to your advantage? Mm-hmm. Well, of course, I never, I never get any kind of rational answer to that uh, because, of course, they're all as we, as we, as I said before, they're all obsessed with their chess games and their maneuvers and all of this. The amount of mental energy that this absorbs is, is very, very difficult. Again, I think for people to, in China to understand. You go to the media here in Britain. When you go to the media in the United States, the amount of time that is devoted to foreign policy is incredible. Yeah, and, and I feel like the United States is just have this obsession about power. They have to be in control yeah. of everything, right? Yeah. And uh, would whoever have a slightest idea to be independent of you know thinking and mm-hmm. have some idea about their own country, they can't tolerate that. They just have yeah, to. Exactly. exactly. Um, <laughs> the last thing is the, the U.S. election. I feel like a, a Kamala Harris is losing ground. I think if there's yeah. uh, uh, this weekend, the past weekend, it seems like multiple scandals. One of whom, which is uh, Kamala herself, had this plagiarism um, mm-hmm. scandal. She wrote she wrote a book that it has multiple places that people pointed out have plagiarized her, which is not surprising. I I don't think she's mm-hmm. a person who can really write a book book. I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. I just don't think she she's capable of writing a book. So uh, she, this is a co-writing, and then there are lots of problems with that. And then, of course, Tim Waltz also has some uh, sexual harassment kind of a rumor is going on. Um, mm. What do you think? Is it pretty much done that uh, we are expecting a Trump presidency now? <laughs> No, no, it is not done, and it won't be until not just the day of the election itself, but for weeks afterwards, <laughs> given given the pattern that we've seen. But I agree with you. It's absolutely clear to me that she's losing momentum, or in fact, her momentum has completely stalled. There's mm-hmm. some opinion polls I understand which are now so showing Trump level on the overall vote. And ahead in the battleground states, yeah, mm-hmm. and one one senses that the ground is shifting gradually in his favour. Now, I think this is not all unsurprising because you know we we've, we've discussed Kamala Harris many times, but beyond anything else, one of the major problems that she has is that she didn't fight to become. The candidate, she never went through a primaries process. She never went through all of those things which you're expected to do, which provide you with the training, the um, level of understanding and knowledge, the feel of what people want to say, so that when you go before a camera, you even you know, assuming you have the intellect to do it properly, you're able to go before the camera and you have your answer. Um, she's not had that. So she's making missteps, and this is the problem the Democrats have landed on themselves by parachuting in an untested candidate. They didn't test her themselves. They didn't find out whether she really is actually the kind of person who can win an election. And of course, she hasn't herself tested herself. Mm. She doesn't know how to conduct an election. Effectively or properly, so that's why she's starting to come unstuck. They're going to have, they have a few weeks to turn it round. I mean, they might do. I mean, you know, and there's all sorts of other things that might happen, as we know. So it's not a done thing, but one can start to see she, see the ground visibly shifting in uh, Trump's favour. And I have heard, and I've heard it from people who. No, mm-hmm. that the private polling and 
we know that there is private polling. There was an article, by the way, by James Antle in the Daily Telegraph, who, who is, you know, a, a prominent Republican. And he confirms that there is private polling. Both the Republicans and the Democrats have, have private opinion polls that provide them with information which is more objectively and rigorously collected than we see in the public polls. But the private polling is now apparently showing in most of the key states Donald Trump clearly ahead. And, you know, that's also creating nerves on the uh, Democrat side and is probably resulting in more errors. Yeah, the way they're trying to beef her up, uh, Obama came out blame lecturing people, which is surprising because I thought Obama, he, he even though he's not that great of a president, but I thought he's a good campaigner, right, for his own mm -hmm. campaign. Well, he would come out and lecturing people and calling the, the black uh, male to vote for her just because she's black. I, I find that's isn't that again? You, you get, they seem so easily forget what Hillary Clinton said about the deplorables, right? You blame the the voters. You are lecturing the voters. How arrogant is that? And of course, there's well, a big blowback of that, right? Well, of course it is. I mean, it, it is incredibly arrogant. It is extraordinarily disdainful, and it comes across also as very manipulative and entitled. And I have to say, it reinforces my own feeling that. Far too many people at the top of the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton, um, Tim Waltz, Kamala Harris, perhaps it now it seems Barack Obama himself, that doesn't surprise me at all, by the way, are, are, are profoundly elitist and don't like don't like a lot of Americans. I mean, I can say that straightforwardly. They don't like many Americans, you know, the uh, in various lower class demographics that they don't feel comfortable mixing with. Yeah. And the other thing is Bill Clinton also came out again. When yeah. you listen to him, it's like, a, is he really helping <laughs> Harris yeah. or not? <laughs> Make yeah. you wonder, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's the, the, um, yeah. the distance, you know, they have the elites versus the regular commoners. I just find it so incredible yeah. how out of touch they really are. It's yeah. Absolutely. And, and, very, un very, very untypical of American history, by the way. Whatever, whatever America was, whether it was truly democratic or not, uh, um, American politicians in the past were connected very closely to their bases, but not anymore, it would seem. <laughs> and even people like I thought both Bill Clinton and Barack Obama were pretty good, you know, yeah, when they were campaigning yeah. for themselves. Yeah, they yeah. were pretty good, like... A, communicating with the the, the audience, mm -hmm. communicating with regular mm -hmm. voters, connect, the, the connection it was there. But once now they have became president, get out of the office, they seems like totally lost it, seems to me. Absolutely. Like, well, abs well, well, absolutely. They've lost their feel. They've lost their mm -hmm. feel for the American pe people. I mean, they don't have their finger on the pulse of the American people, which is what um, successful politicians historically in america have had to have always had you know to be good at mm -hmm. and i suspect the reason partly is because american politics has become so controlled and so managed and so manipulated mm -hmm. that it's difficult to keep that sense of connection that um used to be very much a part of american politics once upon a time now part of the reason i think she's i really think she's done is even Saturday Night Live was laughing about her. You know, they were making skits yeah. laughing about her, which yeah. I find surprising, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody Absolutely. can see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they don't understand also, I think, that uh, they, re they really don't understand people very well. I mean, mm -hmm. I, th I think that even when they try to be, you know, talk in a more simple way, they yeah. do it in a way that is frankly artificial and un mm -hmm. unnatural. And people see right through it immediately. Yeah, you can't fake those things. It's very interesting, you, you know. You yeah, can't. Yeah. Not mm -hmm. not really. No. No. Okay. All right. I think that's all I have. Um like I'll talk to you again. Thank you so much. I know you're really, really busy. So thank you so much. I'll talk my to you. My great pleasure. My great pleasure. Uh, I mean, the thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.